yeah, lots of people have suggestions. I am taking suggestions. Also, thanks for having me on this podcast. I don't know who who canceled to put <laughs> me on the list. We've been talking about this for literally for months. <laughs> Your return guest. And in fact, I should mention this fact that nobody in the world is going to care about. But last time you were on the show, I was freelancing. So I didn't have a cool office like this to come into. This is nice. And you said there's this tea shop in the 50s, Uh the Radiance Tea Shop. And we did the interview there. And I did probably about a dozen interviews there afterwards. That place is great. I haven't been back. It's good and centrally located and like reasonably quiet, which Mm -hmm. is all I was my standards have changed now that like I've got places like this that I could go into. Yes. Well, you know, what's funny is we've kind of switched places because I used to have a very nice office the last time we talked and now I'm freelancing. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that's not, turned. not unusual in the world of publishing. Oh no, it's not. Yeah. I'm much, I'm fine with it. I'm I think, much happier with it. I tell people this all the time and it, like I say this specifically about tech journalism because it's an even smaller world. It's like a niche within a niche. I think I'm just some, I'm somebody who regardless would like tries to like hook people I like up with jobs, but there's this part of me that knows that I'm going to be in that position in the not too distant future. So if I can help people out and get yeah. people well positioned, then oh, I yeah. will be in a good spot <laughs> when I'm looking around for stuff. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, it's it's an interesting time. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what are you going to ask me? I'm feeling a little bit nervous. What What do you need to know? Brian, right. why am I here? Well, okay, let, let, me, let me let me start with a loaded question then. Let's... Okay. Hey, by the way, I'm sorry, let me interrupt you. Yeah. The last time we talked, wasn't it like days before I lost my job? It was like right before that, right? It might have been. I, I, I don't, think. I, I don't remember the timeline. I think it was. Because I think by the time it came out, it was none of it was true anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, hopefully, maybe this will be the other way. Maybe by the time we do this, you'll have an office and I'll be, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll be on the street. No, no. I don't, I'm okay. I don't yeah. need an office. I'm okay. I, I think I asked you, like, as soon as you mentioned that you're moving back, I was like, let's get you back on the show. And you, you were like, I'm not in a place to do that. I'm yes. like, I'm not really feeling. Yeah, I was feeling very transitional yeah. at that point. And I then, mean, which I guess I still, still am, but, uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in a, better you reached out to me and said hey i'm ready to do it maybe yeah. i'm even excited to do it yeah so what's what's changed in the last couple of months oh oh well i mean should i say okay so so yes you know i was in new york mm-hmm. the last time we talked mm-hmm. and then i ran the last away time we talked, i just want to say the last time we talked on microphone we well, have, yeah, oh yeah, we've, yeah. Talked we've, talked. we've talked and then i spent a few years i i fled to the the woods of tennessee mm-hmm. and uh yeah now i've been back for uh well since like last august so yeah when you first asked i was feeling very like a lot of stuff was up in the air and i didn't know you know didn't really have solid projects and stuff and maybe now i do i don't know has it it's been close to a year at this point yeah we came yeah like end of august i think so it doesn't feel that long really but yes Okay, what? That's not an answer to your question. What am I, what's your question? What am I working on? What am I up to? In the past several few months, what has changed in that, you know, you feel like you're in a, at least in a better spot? Yeah. Well, when I came, when I was down in Tennessee for a few years, I was teaching, um, at a university down mm-hmm. there, teaching journalism and also freelancing for a few people. And then, I mean, we can talk more in detail about that. But then when I came up here, I thought, okay, now I can, I don't want to completely get back in the mix. I don't want, I kind of want to avoid being in a cubicle again, but I do want to, you know, get into some projects that maybe I couldn't have done down there. So, you know, I started like this weekly newsletter that's doing pretty well. And then I started this Patreon kind of connected to it. That's doing well. Um, I wrote a a book for kids about how comic books are made, which hopefully is going to branch off into other books. Um, yeah, I have I have several projects. I have a, a grown up bur- book <laughs> that I'm working on. So yeah, I feel a little bit more solid yeah. at this point. I mean, it doesn't sound like there's anything there that you couldn't have necessarily done in Tennessee. Well, you think I could have done all that stuff in Tennessee? I mean, yes, I could have. I could have, but well, I'm, but I'm not sure because I mean, you're putting yourself out there. It sounds like it's kind of the main thing of just. Yeah. Feeling around and seeing what's going on. I mean, I loved being down there because I had uh, the luxuries of space and time, which I never had had in my adult life before. Yeah. Always been in tiny apartments and always just like 
clawing my way through the day. <laughs> Just not, neither one of those things. So, uh, down there I had that, but then, and, you know, when I moved down there, my daughter was two, uh, and now she's old enough to be in school, which also mm-hmm. changes my life, opens it up a bit. So, but yeah, the one thing I realized was that I really didn't have much of a community down mm-hmm. there. There, you know, I had, I had friends and I have people that I miss who are down in Tennessee, but, I don't know. As far as that real community of people that are also have similar interests and similar, I don't know, ambition, I that never really found that. Yeah. And so when I came, that was one reason why I decided it was time to, to come back. And so I've really, I've tried to, you know, not lock myself in my apartment all day, every day, though that happens sometimes and get out and kind of reconnect with with people because I spent a lot of time in the woods. You know, you spent so much time thinking about what you would do when you came back here with regards to like how much you would socialize and all the people you would see that like you would feel bad if you, <laughs> if you had just had come all the way back to New York and kind of hold yourself up again. Yeah. I mean, there's a real, I, there's value to both. I have seen both. I, I'm so glad I did it because I had, cause I would you know, I don't know. I, uh, city people often wonder mm-hmm. and <laughs> what is it like to have a, have a house and a yard yep. and garage and I don't, it's like Crosby Stills and Nash songs. I what had, it is. yes, and I had all those things, and it was very nice until it wasn't anymore. And I realized maybe those are overrated, and it's time for me to go back where I because I do feel more alive when I'm surrounded by people and culture and art and. Not to say none of those things were down there, but it's both places feel like home and this is the right place for me. I realized something after I first moved out here and then went back home for the first time and went back to Santa Cruz where I went to school. I don't know if you've been to Santa Cruz, but the school is it's like right in the middle of the Redwood Forest. Oh. And I was walking around and I was like, Oh, yeah, I had forgotten this is gonna sound really stupid, but I had forgotten what like complete darkness was like and I had forgotten what what silence was like. Like right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna edit this out, but there's that this that white noise sound happening right now mm-hmm. in the room, and and I think that that's kind of analogous to what it's like being in New York City, where it's just like it's always something. We get really good at compartmentalizing, yeah, but it's makes it impossible to really slow down and to really shut your brain off because you feel like you kind of have to be on edge all the time. Yeah. Yes. Um. I know. I'm trying to find. A happy medium. I think it definitely helped for me to be down, down there where I was at a slower pace. And now I feel like a bit of a, you know, I feel like I can handle it being here in a better way. It was probably like a combination of things when you're down there, you know, because not only obviously the pace of life, just generally being slower for better or for worse, but having a young child, like you're not I mean, you're not able to socialize in the same way, right? I mean, yeah, that's, that's just true. like so much of your life. And those two things were happening at the same time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, for sure. But down there, that was also part of the reason why I left New York. So, yeah, I lost my job and did talk to a bunch of other people mm-hmm. in the following weeks after that happened and ultimately just realized I can't do this again i can't with regards to trying to find like your next gig. Uh, yeah yeah yeah, another job i just you know the idea of doing the same kind of thing and cranking out what was now called content Mm -hmm. which is so it just oh it made me and having you know somebody watch my young child for 40 hours a week and uh, all that stuff i was like i can't do it i can't do it and so that played a big part in me wanting to go down there because, you know, flexible schedule. I could be a better, be a better mother, be a better person, mm-hmm. be a better everything. At USA Today, you had your column. You had mm-hmm. your, your, I was going to say your face, but really a whole full body like picture on the column of you. It was like, it was like your branded thing. Yeah. Was that the dream job? Was that the exact thing that you were looking for prior to that? Oh, well, I mean, that's tough to say because I started working at USA Today right after I graduated college. Mm -hmm. And I started that as I started Pop Candy as a column, a weekly column, and it it grew into a blog. So it's not even something that I knew existed or it just kind of like evolved in that way. Um, And there... Yeah, I mean, I loved, there were things, I loved that job. It was great. But there were also very, 
it was very stressful. Definite periods of burnout. And, you know, I had like a long period of depression. And it's, you know, it's not a sustainable what I was doing is just it's not sustainable. Depression pertaining to the actual the job itself? Well, I think that played a part in it for sure. Um, yeah, I had like a long period. This is so funny. I was just on like another podcast and mentioned this. So and we'll have to now beat them. It's we'll be... have to beat them out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, How many podcasts have you done today? Not, no. Uh, no, this was not not today. Okay. I have one podcast today. All right. That's my, that's my that's limit. The, that's the doctor recommended. <laughs> but yeah, I so yeah, I worked uh, at USA Today for 15 years, which is very. <laughs> it's I mean, yeah. When I, you know, my students, when I taught, just were incredible. They could not. It's unimaginable now that somebody would work at the same company for 15 they were years. Four when you started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, it was just that kind of gig because I wrote about all facets. It wasn't like I was just writing about yeah. music or film. Or, I was writing about everything and, you know, the pressure to create just increases and to crank out stuff. And so, yeah, like after you're, it's just exhausting. And so, you know, the pressure to like get posts so many times a day and then even post on social media and like have people click on your head, mm-hmm. like all that stuff. Yeah. It eventually, and it's interesting because of course I'm not the only, there are many other kind of bloggers from that era who have similar stories to to tell of burnout or depression or just like a crash of yeah. some sort and yeah i did experience that I, this is sort of something that I've, I've grappled with a lot over the years is whether or not curation can be as creatively fulfilling as creation it's something like especially with the with the advent of the internet that's become a like a big in- industry in and of itself a lot of people out there doing great jobs of it but you know i I certainly like i got into this gig to be a writer i i enjoy the Mm -hmm. act of writing and i do sometimes wonder whether it's it's possible to sort of have that same sort of creative fulfillment writing about other people's work oh yeah i i think that too yeah i have a lot of thoughts on because i still haven't completely figured it out myself but yeah i like i certainly like a mix of that i mean curation in terms of like i i love like recommending. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, my whole thing. And I just love recommending things to people and turning people on to cool stuff. But yes, I think it has to be, I personally anyway, have to balance it out with some sort of thing I'm creating Mm -hmm. or writing. And maybe that's in journalism and maybe it's, maybe it's apart from it. It's something that when you were in the routine that you were in at USA Today that you just didn't have time to do. As you said, like there were so many different facets that you couldn't really have a a side hustle in the same way or at least like when you finish that job the last thing in the world you want to do is more writing yeah that's true i mean there were i could kind of plan like long term you know like longer term Mm -hmm. stuff sometimes but yeah i mean there are some exhausting things especially you know when you have a baby (laughs) yeah it's it's all very very tiring yeah yeah what were were you working on at the same time when you're working at usa today where you were you had some side oh at usa today i yeah i don't think i did I have stuff? I don't know. <laughs> Certainly, it's hard to Do I remember. Have dreams? I can't remember. Uh, I mean, I feel like like now I'm finally getting to the point where I have time yeah. and the perspective to be able to take on some of those things. Mm-hmm. So for sure, you know, when I was there, I would be approached by, you know, agents or pe- people who are kind of curious about book ideas or TV show ideas or stuff like that. And yet often I just I couldn't. And it's too bad, <laughs> but I just could not wrap my head around, how, you know, how do mm-hmm. I do that? How do I do that in addition to all the stuff I'm doing right now? How long had you been working on the kids' book? Oh, that? Um, gosh, the, I don't know. I kind of cranked that out pretty fast. Several months. <laughs> yeah, that, it was just, well, that's, it's called We Make Comics. And it's actually, it's on like a platform that's, this, this if you have kids, you probably have heard of it. But uh-huh. it's called Epic. It's a digital library. It's available for free in schools nationwide and public libraries. And then also it's like Netflix as a subscription. If you want to have it at home for like five bucks a month, you get access to amazing kids' books, tons of stuff. And yeah, I just did like their first nonfiction book mm. about and I just really wanted to do it like how comic books are made and I'd talk to people who make comics for kids and they explain just because when I was a kid I don't remember seeing anything not only comics but anything like say in comics I 
can't draw at all. And it was never clear to me that, oh, if I wanted to work in comics, I could, like, there are all these jobs, all these different people and talents it takes to make this yeah. one thing. You know, you don't have to just be able to draw to work in comics. You don't have to just be able to, like, play an instrument to work in the music industry. Like, you know, I just want kids to know. It takes teamwork. Yeah. All kinds of jobs. I think there was kind of a, a universal experience. You, you may or may not have had this, but of going to the library and checking out, like, those how to draw books. Oh, yeah. Where If it was, like, Donald Duck. And they're, they're always they're always exactly the same or it would just be, like, a circle. <laughs> and then like like a, a line through the circle, a horizontal line, and then a vertical line, and then all of a sudden you have Donald Duck. But that was like yeah. that was all of us sort of kind of grasping <laughs> and trying to figure out like you know what how we could possibly take that next step. Oh, I know, yeah. Or even I don't know. It, it was forever before I even knew there was such such thing as a letterer. I mean, mm. just you know, these are just I just as a kid certainly never knew. How did that come about? Well, for that book project, I had heard from a friend of mine was an editor there and I found out he, he was working there and you know, so he said, if you ever have an idea and I was like, you know what? I got some time and I do have ideas. Yeah. You've planted the seeds and you're finally able to kind of start like reaping them now because you've got a little bit more time to do that. A little bit. And well, and like, yes, I do have a little bit of time and a little bit of freedom to do that, but also a willingness to take some risks, which mm. I don't know that I had when I was younger. D did that feel like a risk, the kids' book? Well, I just mean in terms of financially. You know, I'm not, I'm not making yeah. the kind of money that I would if I were sitting in an office mm -hmm. all day, all hours of the day. Have you gotten better at time management? That was my biggest issue with freelancing. You know, I, I'm i not so bad at it because having a kid made me much better at time management yeah. because every, you know, minute of my life is scheduled. Mm -hmm. So I have no choice but to be good about it. So, yeah, I do my whole, scheduling. I'm not I'm not so bad at all that stuff. Toward the end of the time with Pop Candy that you were like you were, you were so burnt out that you were just kind of ready to get completely away from it. But you moved back here and you started doing the newsletter, which is a form of that. It I mean, is. what's the difference other than, I guess, kind of just the, the sheer amount of time it takes? I know. Well, I mean, I wasn't. Let me. I mean, OK. Listen, I wasn't your life completely. Was horrible. You were miserable. Yes, I was not you had the worst out. job in the world. I yeah. I I was not complete when when I lost my job. That was still very shocking to yeah, me. Of course. And you know, it was still a lot to handle. But yeah, and so now yeah, I just started to do. Well, I took years off. I was down. I didn't do any. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any blogging or any of that stuff when I was down in Tennessee. I took time away, which I. I I would say, Brian, you need to move. Just everybody needs to spend some time. Just I've thought, go down. I thought south, a lot about it. Yeah. Get get a little house in the woods. Yeah. It'll help. I like and Athens then quite a bit. Maybe I'll go down there, eat some good food, chill out. The issue, though, is this idea of momentum, though, I and mean, that that's the thing that concerns me is that you know just sort of like backing completely out for a while and coming back like all of the momentum and everything i i had sort of like built and worked on would be gone oh yeah i know i get that too yeah. i understand that and then but then i don't know sometimes i just think well you just get in sometimes you get in a mode in especially in a city like new york like everybody's clawing their way like they're sure. Yeah, they're yeah. moving so fast. They're move, clawing their way to the top. And then it's kind of like you stand back, or at least I did. It's like, wait, what am I doing this well, yeah, for? And, and sometimes, I mean, sometimes, God help us, sometimes it takes like some sort of external force in order for us to be able to do that, to, to kind of give us the perspective. Now, like the, like I've been laid off a couple of times because I've, I work in publishing and they impacted me in, in different ways. If you want to be completely internal about it, you can, you can just get super depressed over it and, and not really see the way forward. But this sounds like it gave you a little bit of perspective. It's sort of like, I, I think about it a lot. Like, I don't, do you ever meditate? 
Oh, I mean, I try. You tried. Enough. You know what? Yes, when I lost my job, I actually did every single day. Yeah. Sat on the promenade and did it. So, yes. so, so you'll, I mean, I think you'll relate to this in that, you know, w- one of the things about it, about sort of like uh, trying to, to shut things out is you start to like notice things in your body. Like maybe you notice like you have like a, a leg ache that you didn't have, you know, that you didn't notice before because mm-hmm. you've been like so compartmentalized and focused on everything else. And this is similar from, from the standpoint of you've got to be outside of it to realize whether or not it was ultimately good for you. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, yes, there's something to be said for momentum and like being in the mix, Mm -hmm. but then also sometimes it's good. You got to get away and that can help you change your course. Sometimes, you know, you just need a new direction or at least I felt like I did. I think like from, from my perspective and and something I'm constantly trying to get better about and, and, and this like, (laughs) <laughs> meditation and my mindfulness like comes into this is trying to be happy with with what you have um there's a lot to be said for having goals and like constantly working and trying to strive and achieve those things but if you're always focused on that you're unable to take stock in, in what you have and i and i think your, your calm is a really good example of that in that there was a lot about it that was kind of killing you a little bit over time but you know now that you've stepped away from it and i think you can probably like appreciate like what a cool and very specific and individual opportunity that was oh yes oh my gosh i'm so i am very grateful for that Mm -hmm. i mean i had such freedom to write about so many different things and write about them from my perspective and give it i mean that is the one i loved having a platform to give artists attention who i felt really deserved it and were not getting attention elsewhere. I mean, sometimes I wrote about sort of mainstream things like, I don't know, the TV show Lost or something. But but most of the time, I tried to pull in other people into that big platform, that wide audience. I was very conscious of that when I was there. And it was a miracle that I was able to get away with that for as long as I was. Was that a hard line to walk, though? Because I, I would expect that given what USA Today is, it, like, it's literally the paper that at every hotel you, like, open up the door and it's, like, sitting there in the morning, right? I mean, that's a huge... Is it still at hotel? Or, I don't know. It was for at least for <laughs> yeah. a very long time. But, a bit like, that's how mainstream it is. You know, it's yeah. like, might, they, you know, they might as well, like, be giving it out with, like, you know, cups of coffee or, like, as you walk on the subway or whatever. But because of that, because they're trying to appeal to such a wide audience, do you feel like you were kind of pushed into being a little bit more more mainstream like did people ever kind of cock their eyes at you when you got a little too obscure oh i don't think so i think for the most part honestly i was i was left alone and sometimes you know things that i wrote about that maybe they weren't super familiar with they could tell were getting it was getting some attention Mm -hmm. so it was like well she's sort of like she's doing something because people are writing you know about like reading it and paying attention to it so no i was never really i mean i'm sure there are examples i just can't think of them but i was never really pushed to like write about I don't know, like Will and Grace or, you know, like something <laughs> that was super mean because they, you know, that they knew that I was not the person yeah. to tackle that at yeah. all. There's a goal specifically with, with the newsletters or something that you're kind of that you're you're trying to, to do with it. Are you just sort of feeling things out right now? I mean, well, I I guess when I came back, I felt like I needed because you talked about momentum. So I, yeah. I came back here and I was like, OK, well, I need something to kind of serve as a calling card in a way to let people know I'm back and I'm, you know, I'm working and I'm Mm -hmm. writing and I'm taking gigs. And if you're making stuff, I'm, you know, I might want to pitch whatever you're doing to somebody. So that's one reason that I started it just as a way to kind of get back, get back in there. But then also I did it just because over that period of three years, whatever, when I was in Tennessee, I still heard from so like, Almost every day from people who would say like, oh, I miss pop candy or I miss reading your stuff or, you know, what are you doing? And so I realized, okay, there are – I'm not alone. Like there are people who – still remember yeah. and seem to – it seemed to resonate with them. So, you know, maybe if I just independently start something – and it just felt right to do it as a news – like, you know, just do it on my own rather than – align myself again with 
with a company or with a, a website or something. So yeah, it would, but that was partly it too, because I thought, okay, well, I can start something to kind of talk about myself and what I'm into, but also pull in these people because there were, there was a big commute. I mean, there are people who met in like the comments on my blog and got married and had children. And I mean, it's just, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. I did it for, for both of those reasons. Were you writing at all when you were down South? I was, well, I was free. Mainly I was right when the writing I was doing was freelancing for publications and also some kind of like PR related mm-hmm. stuff and like consulting related stuff, entertainment yeah. wise. And then there are other things I was writing that have not been published that are more, because as you might imagine, that's an interesting experience to go from New York yeah. City down to yeah. Tennessee and teach at a state university. I have some other things that I'm not completely sure what I'm going to do with, but I certainly, yeah, so I certainly have like stuff. I don't know. This is just kind of the way I'm wired, but like my impulse. So, so last year I was forced to take a vacation because I'm not good at taking vacations. Oh my gosh. Yes. You have to take a vacation. And like, and, and this will happen every once in a while. My like bosses and coworkers will be like, all right, you need to take a week away. Yes. I was like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the woods and I'm going to write. I'm just going to like spend this entire time writing. Ooh. Was that a vacation for you? How did that feel? I do what I do because. All I ever wanted to do professionally was write. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it doesn't mean I'm writing, like, exactly what I want to write. So right. in the same way that, like, if I was traveling, I would always have my little laptop sleeve with my podcasting equipment because I like to interview people. That part doesn't really – but the pressure, that's what ultimately got to me. And this was all my own pressure on myself was that I had this rare opportunity to be quiet in the woods and to only focus on – writing and that's what ultimately got to me is yeah. it was like i felt like i needed to come out of that week having written something that i would have had the opportunity to do otherwise yeah and like pressure to be productive i get this a lot when i go to, to museums you know I'll, I'll stand in front of a painting and just wonder if i'm getting like the effect that i'm supposed to get from that painting <laughs> like there's a right hand like there's a yeah. right answer to or, or, or or you know you hear like people have these like sort of like really like like profound moments Mm -hmm. and i'll just sort of like stand there and then just feel like i I, i'll put this like tremendous amount of pressure on myself because i'm like i'm not doing it right or if you're like on vacation and you're in a place you've always wanted to be in and maybe you're not getting exactly the the feeling that you hoped you would get when you were there that overthinking it kind of takes away from the actual act of being there oh yes yeah i totally understand you know when i was in so i lived in murfreesboro tennessee which is outside of nashville Mm -hmm. and there is a battlefield there that has like a path he, many paths, but there's like a wooded path. <laughs> this is a this is a Robert Frost. Film. Yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is like the lead song after on my new Americana. Uh-huh. Album. Uh, but I would go there like you know several times a week. I would drop off my child very early in the morning at her preschool, and I would walk in this in the woods yeah. on this path. Oh my gosh, that I'm miss that so so much i miss it i mean i do a different kind of walking in the city but oh i got i feel like i got so much out of that just like walking so when you're there you're like you know you know maybe you're enjoying it but you're like oh my foot hurts or have a doctor's appointment i i need to be at tonight and you're like you're worried about that but in 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 hindsight when you're when you're outside of it it, it like you you tend to remember the really positive things about it. Oh, I mean, it was, it, I felt very positive. I, I yeah. have like hundreds of nature wood. Maybe that's my next project. I have many photos taken in the woods of creatures on my, on my blog. This, is, this podcast is veering. Tell me a little bit about the experience of, of teaching, though. People have asked me about writing, about becoming a professional writer, and my instinct is to always like tell them, if you feel like it's the that the only thing you can do, then absolutely do it. But if you feel like there's another path for you, like this is a, a pretty tough road to go down. And yeah. there, there must be an element of that to teaching journalism of trying to be very pragmatic and realistic with people and letting them know that like they're, they're going down a tough road. Oh, yes. Well, I think they're completely aware of that. Yeah. Uh, if nothing else, a lot of their parents are telling them they're <laughs> yeah. making a bad decision, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah, I, I was the journalist in residence, and so I taught, and then I also, you know, 
wrote and worked on this other project where, you know, I helped get students, student journalists, their work published in bigger publications other than the students. So I, I would, you know, work with them on doing like regional or national stories and help them get bigger bylines mm. so that they, they could come out of college, you know, with yeah. good clips that aren't yeah. just from their student publication. But yeah, I had never taught before and they were wonderful down there and um, let me develop courses as well as kind of update some of the courses that they'd had for a long time. So for instance, like their editing course, I mean, mm. it had been, they it just needed a refresher uh, from somebody who was, who was in that world. What's changed in editing? Well, I think because, you know, now editors have to know how to do all sorts of jobs. So, okay. you know, so like fact so you checking have to, and... yeah. And you have to incorporate like just at least the basics of like photo editing and, you know, mm. o- other, other things. So, yeah. So I, I taught, like I did a course on pop culture reporting. Mm-hmm. I started like a, um, we did a music journalism course. Uh, I had one where it was like reporting on Nashville, uh, because that's, the city was close by and it's such so fascinating and it's growing so fast. But yes, it was, I mean, it's very hard <laughs> teaching, but, uh, I, I really did enjoy it. And, um, I don't know. I was kind of, I kind of surprised myself because I, I think I was pretty good at it. <laughs> and I, I really liked being with, you know, my students and I like being around, I do like being around young people and I love that energy. But it is, it was also very interesting to compare, you know, that generation with when I was in school. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just some of the differences and, you know, things that they grew up with or, I mean, a lot of them were like, would ask me what it was like on September 11th. Like, they're just so, you know, they're so young. And some things that were challenging for them were not as challenging when I was that age. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, face-to-face communication sometimes was a big challenge for them with regards to them actually like going out on the stories and and speaking to people in person you mean yes yeah like um or even like having them just call people for quotes sometimes that could be a challenge because when you Mm. think about it younger people they don't talk on the phone like that's just a skill that's a thing that hasn't really been a huge part of their lives so yeah that or just like you know maintaining i got some with some of the students yeah. and stuff like that. But I, I did really like it. And I, yeah, I had the best students. I had a lot of, um, it's just a mix of students. Some of them are doing really great work now and have, you know, gone on to, I'm, I'm following what they're doing. I had some, I had a lot of veterans. I had some who had had children and families and now we're coming back to school. Mm. And I just, there's always, a wide range of ages. Yes. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I just thought that was, I just loved getting to know yeah. all of them on a personal level too. Yeah. What for them was, was sort of the gold standard, you know, like I remember, I, I, I really want to get into music journalism, you know, so for me, like the, like, it was always like 60s, 70s Rolling Stone, right? Like yes. That was, what are, what are they looking at now? You know, what are the things that are really kind of the, again, the entire paradigm has shifted. I mean, is it like, God, is it like stuff like Vice? Is it that kind of reporting that? Oh, well, yeah, some of them for sure yeah. love Vice. Some of them really just were focused like they wanted to be on TV. Like I had some, you know, a lot of students who mm. wanted to be like sports reporters, like ESPN, like that kind of thing. So it wasn't purely print journalism. No, it depended on the course, really. Mm. I mean, some had, some were writing focused, but a lot, you know, were maybe they were more into video and, you know, other, other stuff, on camera stuff. But yeah, it just depends on the subject because some of the students, like, who wanted to be in music journalism, very interested in country music. And so, they were ma- like maybe Rolling Stone Country was mm-hmm. one, or like they were looking at those kind of publications. Um, Consequences Sound got mentioned okay. a lot, actually. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, sometimes I would be yeah. surprised by the things that they're reading. Yeah, I mean, we also, like, you know, we use New York Times yeah. for, like, everybody had, like, a free New York Times subscription, so we always, like, looked at that. And, yeah, it just, it kind of depended on what their interests were. There was a lot of, uh, let's see, like, Teen Vogue, you know, mm-hmm. at the time. Because yeah. I was teaching during the election okay. season as yeah. well. So, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty zeitgeisty for a hot minute there. Yeah. 
just a mix of stuff. It sounds like you found it fulfilling. I did. I did. And then there just came a point where I felt like it was time to move on. And I really missed, I missed writing. Yeah. And I missed, I was spending more time on the teaching than I was on other stuff. And so if I could reverse it, and maybe I will, it just, yeah, it got to a point where I knew I just had to get, I had to get back. I had to get back to writing. I had to get back here because I mean, the, the pace could not be more different between working at the university, at a university and working in, you know, online media. I yeah. mean, oh my gosh, like it's, it's pretty, it can be frustratingly slow when you're in like an academic environment. It sounds like you're looking for a happy medium between the two and, and the way in which you're reapproaching writing is it is a little bit slower of a pace i mean you know on to, to be very literal about it like doing a weekly newsletter is different than doing like a daily or oh, multi-time yes. a day blog so it's an opportunity to to re-enter that world without it completely consuming you yeah i mean oh for sure i mean i definitely take on and some of the freelance stuff is everybody can read it and some is more kind of you know stuff where it's more on like a consultant or it's like a mm -hmm. people aren't reading it. But yes, I prefer to take on bigger projects now that I hope live a little bit longer because it is for us. I mean, and my students were frustrated too. It is hard when you write something for it to go up and then it disappears 12 hours yeah. later. And I just feel like I, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that anymore. That's it's tough from the standpoint of it just not feeling as meaningful to you if it if it's just ethereal yes i will say that yeah yeah i also i've just I've, i don't like to write what other people are writing about i don't mm. you know i don't want to do things that are too similar to what other people are doing and yeah that is frustrating to me i to and i do it i've done it i've written stuff and it'll go up on a website mm -hmm. and it'll be gone It'll evaporate. Yeah. But then also another thing that makes me sad is a lot of that stuff I did for USA Today is no longer there. Yeah. It's all – it's disappeared. And so that is also in my mind, you know, why I can't spend the bulk of my time doing stuff that I know is going to go away. It's going to – I think this gets back to the beginning of the conversation. I think that's another consequence of doing curatorial work and review work is like in very few instances. Like how many – really famous reviewers can you name who who is like you would sit down and read a, a collection of their work I'm, there are a few there are a few but again like <laughs> versus the amount of people who are doing it i mean it's i think it, it is right. something that's designed to to be ethereal something that's designed to serve as curation for you to get into something else it's it's almost it's like a conduit into somebody else's work yeah yeah. And some, you know, I don't mind. I do reviews from time to mm -hmm. time. I do all that stuff from time to time. But yeah, yeah I think, and also I'm older. I just think sometimes, okay, yeah. I'm going to focus more on the projects that might stick around longer. This might be something that's changing generationally, you know, but certainly I've always been interested in writing a book in that, you know, it, it would feel like a sense of accomplishment that I don't get with the sort of writing that I'm doing right now the flip side of it being that it's easy for me to kind of quantify the work i've done when i can like finish a day and point to 10 oh, articles yeah. i've written yes yeah that is true that's a good feeling at the yeah. end of the day when you have stuff that you can point to again now that you're kind of in a in a better place so you know you've You've done the kids' book. The newsletter is happening. Are you? Do you have longer form projects right now that you're getting started on? I do. I do. Um, I can't talk about a few okay. of them though. Fine. But I mean, one is a book that I'm co-writing with somebody that I adore. Uh, who is? Uh, yeah, that's that's all I should okay. say. And then Betty White, <laughs> Barack Obama, uh, no. Beyonce. You know me. That is not <laughs> my. I'm just, I'm just thinking. I'm just I'm starting from the most adored and then working my way down. All those people are very adored. I'm some, somewhere between Betty White and Donald Trump is is that person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ooh, and and then yeah, I have I have a proposal. I, I have something that hopefully I really. I don't know. I think is is great. It's a proposal, and hopefully, uh, it's gonna go through, and yeah. I can spend you know a good chunk of my life on it. Um, and I already have. And 
oh gosh, this is all very like, and you know, I hope to do more of those uh, more kids books because that one has done very well and I want to do more of that. I don't know. feels good to be excited about a project. Yes. I mean, oh yeah. I mean, also, gosh, should I even mention it? I'll mention it just quickly, but I have been, I've also been writing this play forever. Yeah. I'll just mention it because maybe by mentioning it, it'll force it me to world. finish it yeah. yeah, and put it out because that is the bad thing. Yeah. I, I do too many things and then I don't show them to anybody. Have you written a play before? No. Have you written a screenplay before? No. Do you do you like read books about writing screenplays? You know, I started to, and then I was like, oh, I this is I just need to actually read more plays, yeah, and more screenplays. That's fair. Uh, yeah, because so I think it's good to have books about to read books about writing. There's some that are really valuable to me, but uh, you can't. I, I I don't know. You can't read just read books about writing. You gotta. Sure. Put them down at some point. I'm re- I'm rewatching The Sopranos right now. That's oh one gosh. of my projects, and and like all those scenes with Christopher and his screenplay. You know, like those <laughs> scenes where you can just like see like the ten words that are on the sheet of paper, and that's that's like what I what I think about when I think about me trying to sit down and 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 kind of work with a different part of my brain in order to do that writing. Like, or when people talk about actors reading a screenplay and being. I knew this was great. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I have that in me to like sit down and read a screenplay and know, know that it's a really great thing. You know, it's just like, it's just like, it's a totally different way of thinking about writing. It feels completely alien to me. I will say that is what I love is use it because all of these, I have so many things I'm working on and they all use different parts of my brain. And oh my gosh, that is kind of what gets me excited about writing again because like I'm also doing, I I also cannot talk too much about, but I've been <laughs> ghostwriting for oh. people, and that is really interesting. I've too. always wanted to do that, yeah. and a very different part of yeah. the brain, and strange, but also satisfying and really interesting to like get in the head of yeah. somebody else without mentioning. Because I, I suspect it's like the specifics of the person that you can't talk about. But can you can you talk about the process a little bit i've always wondered about that how much of it is just like literally sitting around with somebody and taking notes yes. and then repurposing them yeah it, i mean that's kind of what it is yeah. it's having a conversation it's this you could go straight okay. for me after this mm-hmm. podcast it's having a conversation and getting a sense of their you know their voice and what's important to them yeah. and you know what they want to convey and then oh, you know on your own trying to like inhabit that space and yet, uh, you know, clean up or perhaps, you know, make make all that stuff, get in their head but and make it a really compelling read. To me, every part of the process sounds interesting and exciting until the point where you have to show it to the person. So far, I've been lucky in that way. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. That is very nerve-wracking. That point after I send it and while I'm waiting for the feedback is very anxiety-inducing. Yeah. But so far – so far, so good. They keep doing interviews with the with Trump's ghostwriter, the the guy who oh, like right. wrote Ar- the Art of the Deal. Yes, I mean that's the worst possible scenario for yeah. a number of reasons. But one of which is that it's somebody who like clearly does not have a sense of humor about himself and who doesn't want anything negative written about himself. And 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 you as a writer know that in order to make this a compelling read, it's going to have to be a little bit warts and all, and you're going to have they're going to have to be interesting stories, and you can't always paint somebody in the best possible light. Yes. So you need somebody who is willing to sort of – is able to be somewhat objective about themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a rare thing with celebrities. Yes, and somebody – who you really enjoy talking to yeah. and enjoy being with. Otherwise, you know, you it's gross. <laughs> right now, it's like one of those things where like maybe day to day doesn't feel like a lot, but then you start listing things off. Yeah, that's like, true. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, I, I wish I had, I feel like my story isn't very linear. Like it's, I have so many different, yeah. but I think that has helped me a lot. Like just, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's just... Maybe 10 years ago, I thought, okay, this is who I am, mm. and this is what I do, and I, you know, this is what I write about, and I've been doing it at this one company for a really long time. Yeah. And then it just helped me to get away and try new stuff and be around different people and in a new environment and be open to lots of other things. You feel like you know yourself better now than you did 10 years ago. I, I mean – Or how much of that is knowing yourself better and how much of that is actually changing? 
Well, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both, but yeah, I feel, I feel like, you know, I don't have to be, I'm this one, this one thing, I don't have to be in this one little box. And yeah, it's more satisfying to do all these other different things, scratch all these different edges. Are you happier? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, then when though? Let's say like now versus not I don't think it was 10 years ago, How, however long ago that was. Let's say now versus sort of the end of your tenure at USA. Today. Oh, yes. Yes. For sure. I mean, just I just think that because I remember, well, bringing a baby into it. Like, I, I am I happier now versus like when I was trying to balance all that stuff? Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, there were so many things I loved about that job and that, you know, life. But yes, I went through a lot of of hard stuff as well related to that. I think I'm a better person, honestly, than I was then. But I don't know. You'll have to tell me. There you go. That was Whitney Matheson. You can check out her stuff and subscribe to her newsletter at WhitneyMatheson.com. Thanks so much to her for joining us again. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the program. If you like the show, there are a number of ways to support us. You can read and review us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or on Spotify and YouTube now. Like us on Facebook. If you have any feedback, it's rwellcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Tumblr. That's rwellcast.tumblr.com. That is the first and best place to get all your RIYL-related information. And that's about all we got for this week so stick around because we're going to be back just about this time next week with another episode of RIYL.